1945. World War II ends and Allied powers must decide how to deal with Ho Chi Minh's nationalist movement in Vietnam. Then, France goes to war against Ho's forces in an effort to regain its former colony. The United States sees the fight as part of the emerging Cold War against the Soviet Union and provides France with financial support. 1950. The U.S. commits a few dozen advisors to the French in their war against the Viet Minh and agrees to pay half the cost. 1954. 40,000 Viet Minh lay siege to the French garrison at Dien Bien Phu and block resupply of the post. In the end, the French lose the fight. Meanwhile, President Dwight Eisenhower likens the events in Southeast Asia to a falling domino process. If one country should fall to communism, he argues, bordering countries would follow in rapid succession. Later that year, Geneva Accords outlining a ceasefire and the division of Vietnam until nationwide elections take place are signed by French and Viet Minh military leaders. The U.S. doesn't sign the pact, but agrees to abide by it. 1956. After 11 years of fighting, the French leave Vietnam. The U.S. steps in with military advisors to help train South Vietnamese forces. 1961, John F. Kennedy takes office and expands U.S. involvement in Vietnam, calling it the cornerstone of the free world in Southeast Asia. 1963, President Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson is sworn in and vows he's not going to lose Vietnam. 1964. In the wake of alleged attacks on U.S. Navy ships in the Gulf of Tonkin, Congress grants President Johnson the power to commit U.S. forces to turn back the North Vietnamese. 1965. By the end of the year, 185,000 American troops serve in Vietnam. For nearly 20 years, America's participation in events in Vietnam was one of support. But once the French gave up the fight, the U.S. gradually took on a more active role. In the end, nearly three and a half million American men and women played a part. In the next half hour, we look back at the Vietnam War through the stories of a group of Marine Corps officers who came to the Corps during one of the most turbulent and troubled times in America's history. U.S. soldiers in South Vietnam. Virginia, November 1967. The basic school at Marine Corps Base Quantico begins teaching the latest batch of newly commissioned officers what it means to be an officer in the Marine Corps. I'm sure some of us were motivated to join the Marine Corps because we would have been drafted, but no, none of us were drafted into the Marine Corps. We were all volunteers. Uh, and uh, despite all you hear, I think most of us were, were quite anxious to, to get involved uh, and uh, to do our part. Looking back, I think that was before the media, the real media frenzy started and before you know, Walter Cronkite announced to the world that we'd lost the war. Because it was prior to Tet. You know, it was prior to Quezon. But those events are on the immediate horizon. In January, as the men of TBS Class 568 continue their second month of training, unexpected critics of the war begin to surface. Just across the Potomac at a White House conference on crime, singer and actress Eartha Kitt denounces the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, more than 8,000 miles away, the North Vietnamese Army lays siege to the remote Marine Corps outpost at Khe Sanh. Just days later, the North launches the countrywide Tet Offensive, with 80,000 troops striking at more than 100 towns and cities, taking Allied forces by surprise. 
And even as the bullets and bombs wreak havoc in Vietnam, in the U.S., more war protesters gather, using words as their weapons. I think that all of us were aware of what was going on, but uh, we were pretty, pretty well focused on what we were doing at the time. Quint Wortham's commission followed two years of service in the Corps' enlisted ranks, all during a time when the integration of African Americans into a broader range of American society was happening. And though U.S. military leaders touted equality within the services, discrimination was still an issue. There was some. However, I think that for the most part, those of us who were in OCS were more enlightened I saw more of it when I was an enlisted man. As training continues for Quint and his classmates, news of other major events filters in. In February, anti-war sentiment grows as Americans react to the Associated Press photograph of Saigon's police chief executing a Viet Cong prisoner. Then President Johnson announces he will not seek re-election. In April, as graduation nears, they learn of a tragic loss in Memphis, Tennessee. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I was with three other officers coming back from D.C. when we heard on the radio that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And that was very upsetting to me because I knew what would happen in this country. You know, I, I knew the explosion that would cause. The base chaplain came in and addressed our, our class. The topic of the sermon was a man was killed today. And that man will be buried shortly. And this country will go on. And I thought in some respects he was trivializing the, uh, the death of uh, a great man, uh, a man who we didn't really fully appreciate until some years later. While the country mourns, word arrives that the siege of Quezon has finally been lifted, although both sides claim victory. Two days later, the classmates reach their goal, graduation. Additional specialized job training is planned for most, then Vietnam.